Hi there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. If you've been with us for the last few weeks, you know that we've been doing a study on the things of the last days. On, I, it, was, we, it was called a clear and present danger about the, the events that are taking place in the world and in the church right now. They are certainly indicative of the nearness of his coming and the things that we have to be on guard against. So I want to continue along that line. Uh, I, I think that we need to understand what it faces us in these perilous last days and how we are to be prepared for them. So I'm going to talk today um, about being prepared for his coming. And so this will be a, the first part of this, and I don't know how long this will go. This is, you know, as led by the Spirit. It is really imperative that we understand that these are perilous days. Okay, Paul wrote that to Timothy. In the last days, perilous times will come. Peril means great danger. So the danger is still there. And it's a present danger. I'm just not sure how clear a danger it is to so many people in the church. So I want to sound the alarm. I want, I want to kind of bring attention to what we are have to be prepared to deal with, to face, to live in and through for the glory of God, should we be ones that are here at the, at the very last. And the odds of that are not bad, actually. So what we're going to be talking about is to make ready his people for the coming of the Messiah. The Lord sent John the Baptist to prepare his way. Okay? So that's where we're going to start. But first, I want to just ask, Father, that you would bless this time. That you would bless us, Lord, as we go into your word. To grow in our knowledge of you. To grow closer to you. To be more like you, Lord God. To be prepared for the things that we will face. And, Lord, that we will face them as you would desire. So we thank you, Lord, for the power of your word at work in our lives. And, Lord, I just pray that you would touch everybody that, that watches this. Lord, that you would bless me and guard my mouth. So I just praise you and thank you for that, Lord. All right, as I just said, when, when God was sending Jesus, the Messiah, the promised Messiah, into the world the first time, and there is a second time coming, he sent John the Baptist. And the angel Gabriel announced to John's father, Zechariah, and he proclaimed of John, and he will turn many of the sons of Israel back to the Lord their God. It is he who will go as a forerunner before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children and the disobedient to the attitude of the righteous so as to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. His message to the people of God was to point them, John's, was to point them to Jesus proclaiming, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John 1.19, right? That was his first and foremost mission, was to proclaim and draw people to the attention of Christ, their attention to Christ. But it's not a general thing, because what the next thing he does is he calls the people to repent. Right? That's what it's about, is repentance. His message was repentance. Not to the world, but to the people of God, to prepare people for the, the coming of Christ, the, the Christ, the Messiah. To repent means to change our minds. That's literally what the word means, repent, metanoia, right? It's not a general thing. It's a very specific thing. The Apostle Paul made it clear when he said, have this attitude in you, in yourselves, which also was in Christ Jesus. Philippians 2, 5. That's the New American Standard. But the King James says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. We have the mind of Christ. That's what it says. But we have to operate in the mind of Christ. So Paul continues on. He says, when he, when he said, have this mind in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, 
taking the form of a bond servant and being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Philippians 2, that's 5 through 8, all right, that I read. A mind, an attitude, made perfectly clear by Jesus, who came not to, to be served, but to serve, he said, right? And when he prayed to the Father, as he faced the horror of the cross, he said, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Luke twenty-two forty-two. That is the mind of Christ, saying to the Father, not my will, but thy will be done. You know, and we've talked about this a few times in, in recent weeks. When Jesus, the family of God, I mean, you can talk about church membership, but it's about the family of God. And Jesus, when somebody told him that when he was teaching in a house and somebody said, well, you know, your mother and brothers are, are outside the house. He looked at him, that person and said that and said, who is my mother and my brothers? And he said, whoever does the will of my father, he is my brother, my, my mother, my brother. My. The family of God is the people who do the will of the father. The, th the thing is, that means you can't do your own will. You have to surrender your will to the father and do what God wants, do what the father wants and not what you want. That's the battle, that is the raging battle that is going on that we need to be prepared for. It's a battle of your will against the will of God. Satan has no power over you. But he came and he was very subtle from the very beginning. That's the first revelation in, in uh, Genesis chapter 3, that the serpent was more crafty, more subtle than any other beast of the field. He has no power over you. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. But what he will do is try to coerce you for you to operate in your will rather than God's will. That's the battle in the last days. Behavior, when Jesus said, not my will, but thy will be done, right? That's behavior that is controlled by attitude. You understand that? When you surrender your will and say, not my will, but thy will be done, that's your, your behaving based on your attitude towards God, all right? Behavior controlled by attitude. Your attitude, your mind, should be controlled by a heart surrendered completely to the Father. That's the definition of humility, total surrender to God. John the Baptist, who was sent to prepare people for the coming of the Lord, said, he must increase, but I must decrease. That's true in every one of our lives. Christ has to become more and more in our lives. But in order for that to happen, we have to become less and less in our own lives. In these perilous last days, when we have been warned that men will be lovers of self, that's what Paul wrote to Timothy in, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 and 2, we had better check our attitude Check our mind and see if it is like that of Jesus or like that of the world. Paul wrote to the Corinthians and said, examine yourselves to see if you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Or do you not recognize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail the test? 2 Corinthians 13, 5. We've got to examine ourselves. Are we prepared? And preparation this is not the prepper stuff where you're not know, prepared, you get a bomb shelter or something. This is, are you prepared? Because you are willingly surrendering your will, your life to God the Father. It's his. You're not your own. You were purchased with a price. So any examination, any test, has to be judged and proved against a standard. All right? There has to be a standard which, by which everything is measured against. And that standard here is without a doubt the teaching of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. I promise you that's the truth. If you don't know that, please go spend time and read Matthew 5, 6, and 7. 
because it truly determines and defines the behavior of a disciple and it depends on a right attitude. So you have a behavior plus the attitude and what do you wind up with? A beatitude. Now one of the things that's going on, I wanna, I wanna just read one of the beatitudes. I'm gonna read this from Matthew 5, 7. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Uh, let me preface this by reminding us all of this, that Jesus said that in the last days, because lawlessness is increased, most people's love will grow cold. Matthew 24, 12. You know, lawlessness is... In America right now, I think there are probably close to 8 million people in the United States who are part of the penal system they, they, because of crimes they've committed. They're either in prison, jail, or they're on parole, or, but one way or the other. I mean, it's almost 8 million people okay, who have been caught in crime and punished for their crime. Um, and that's an incredible number. But if you think that that's the only measure of lawlessness, you're not appraising things spiritually, okay? Because ungodly behavior is the absolute lawlessness that fills the world that we live in today. If you can't control your tongue and you disobey the, the law, the word of God, it says, let no unwholesome word proceed from your lips, you're practicing lawlessness. Now, the world may celebrate that rather than put you in jail, but it's a lawlessness that he's talking about. If you're being selfish, you're practicing lawlessness. If you're focused on yourself, and we're living in the age of selfies, you're practicing lawlessness. It's not just going out and bonking somebody on the head and taking their money. You need to understand that. The lawlessness that is infecting and affecting the world that we live in today is spiritual because everything is spiritual that matters, all right? What is mercy? Mercy is, and I wanna just read from the Random House Dictionary in the Collins English Dictionary. It's kindly forbearance shown towards an offender, an enemy, or other person in one's power. It's about how you treat your enemies. The discretionary power of a judge to pardon someone will mitigate punishment. In other words, when you're talking about mercy, you're talking about somebody who has done harm to you and how you respond. You have to understand that, okay? And then remember this. I mean, if you go ask your denomination, you know, what, what are you supposed to be doing? And they can tell you about, well, you gotta come to this festival, you gotta tithe, you gotta do this, you gotta do that. But I wanna tell you what God says. Because he spoke to the prophet Hosea so long ago and said, here's what, for I desired mercy and not sacrifice and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. Hosea 6.6. 6. That's what God desires, mercy. So mercy, but he said mercy and the knowledge of God. You see, mercy apart from the knowledge of God is no more than man's sympathy. And that will be short-lived at best and lacking eternal effect and durability. To understand mercy, and we, we need to understand mercy. I mean, we throw terms around inside the church, and at times people don't understand what anybody's talking about. We've developed our own, no, we've not developed our own language. We've forgotten the language of God, but that's another story. So if you're gonna understand mercy, we have to start with the mercy seat. Okay, because this takes us back to when God had delivered the people and taken them out of bondage in Egypt. And what was one of the most important things he did? He gave mo the model for the Ark of the Covenant to Moses to be built. And here's what he said. You shall make a mercy seat. That's how it starts. The Ark of the Covenant starts, you shall make a mercy seat. The Hebrew for that, by the way, is kapareth. And I want to tell you why that's important in a minute. Make a mercy seat of pure gold, two and a half cubits long and one and a half cubits wide. You shall make two cherubim of gold. Make them hammered work at the two ends of the mercy seat. Make one cherub at one end and one cherub at the other end. You shall make the cherubim of one piece with the mercy seat at its two ends. 
The cherubim shall have their wings spread upward, covering the mercy seat with their wings and facing one another. The faces of the cherubim are to be turned towards the mercy seat. You shall put the mercy seat on top of the ark, and in the ark you shall put the testimony which I will give to you. There I will meet with you. And from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim which are upon the ark of the testimony, I will speak to you about all that I will give you in commandment for the sons of Israel. That's Exodus 25, verses 17 to 22. The foundation of the Ark of the Covenant is the mercy seat. Now, there's a reason I mentioned the kapareth, which is the Hebrew word. And by the way, hilasterion was a Greek word that's used there. And propitiatorium is the Latin word. Now, I'm not trying to give you a college course here, but I, it's really important to understand some of these things. The kapareth, the mercy seat, was literally the place where God and man met. It's a, all right. That was a purpose for God and man to come together and meet. Now, why? Because I'm reading from Romans 3, starting at verse 20. Because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his, justified in his sight. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Christ Jesus for all those who believe. For there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displays publicly as a propitiation. That's that Greek word, illusterion in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness because in the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed. Romans 3, 20 to 25. God displayed Jesus as the, publicly as a propitiation. That's that same word that is used on the Ark of the Covenant for the mercy seat. Jesus Christ is the mercy seat. And then in Hebrews 2, 17, it says, Therefore he, talking about Jesus, had to be made like his brethren in all things, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for those of the whole world. That's 1 John 2, 2. You see, Jesus is the propitiation. What's the propitiation? It's the mercy seat on top of the Ark of the Covenant, where God said he would meet with man. The only place that God and man can come together is Jesus Christ. I mean, when Jesus said in John 14, 6, which I'm sure you know, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. He is the only place that you can meet God the Father. He is the mercy seat on the top of the Ark of the Covenant. John went on in 1 John 4.10 to say, In this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. For there is one God and one mediator also between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. 1 Timothy 2.5 Jesus is literally the place where God Almighty and man meet for the forgiveness of sin, which is mercy. All right? Mercy is all about God's amazing grace. The amazing grace that he has poured out, and I pray you have received, because it needs to be received. So, and mercy is made manifest. Remember, we, we just did a, a study on manifestation. There's a difference between being foretold and being manifest. Manifest is when it happens, right? I want to read from John chapter 8. I want to read verses 2 to 11. And early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all of the people were coming to him, and he sat down and began to teach them. And the scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery, and having set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in adultery, in the very act. 
Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. What then do you say? And they were saying this, testing him, in order they may have grounds for accusing him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground. But when they persisted in asking him, he straightened up and said to them, he who is without sin among you, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And when they heard it, they began to go out one by one, beginning with the older ones. And he was left alone and the woman where she was in the midst. And straightening up, Jesus said to her, woman, where are they? Does no one condemn you? And she said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go on your way. From now on, sin no more. See, the law, by the way, Jesus did not break the law in doing this. Because the law says there has to be two or three witnesses. But when Jesus wrote on the ground, we don't know what he wrote. Did he write the sins of the people who were standing there? Did he write just the names of sins and people, I mean, in their guilt walked away? But the fact was, at the end, there was nobody bearing witness against her. So Jesus was free to let her go. What about us? Do we accept the mercy, the saving grace that only Jesus can provide? James wrote, for whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one point has become guilty of all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not commit murder. Now, if you not, do not commit adultery, but do commit murder, you become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment will be merciless to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs or rejoices, the King James says, over judgment. James 2, 10 to 13. If you're not merciful, don't expect mercy. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, you know, you've got to forgive others because if you don't forgive others, God will not forgive you. You need to think about this because in the perilous last days, one of the things that's going to happen with this lawlessness is you're going to have a natural reaction. This is the truth. You're going to react to all the lawlessness. Those people need to be cheated. They need to be taken. They need to be thrust in the deepest, darkest pit. They are evil. They've done, and that's going to be the natural reaction. Show no mercy. But you know what? It's not our job to judge them. That's what it says in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. We're not to judge the people out in the world. God says, I'll take care of that. We are, however, to be judging what's going on inside the church. In the family of God. There's too much going on. We let, let slide. But the outsiders, it's not that they're getting away with it. God's going to deal with it. Mercy doesn't abrogate or invalidate justice. Mercy doesn't take away justice. God is both a just and merciful Savior. It says in Isaiah 45, 21, Declare and set forth your case. Indeed, let them consult together. Who has announced this from, the, from of old? Who has long since declared it? Is it not I, the Lord? And there is no other God besides me, a just God and a Savior. There is none except me. Isaiah 45, 21. Jesus did not erase the punishment for sin. Not at all. He chose to take it upon himself for those who would receive. Mercy is where the law and grace meet. Now, this idea of the meeting places is very important. And I'm not talking about big church buildings because that's not what God has chosen. It is not. Okay? Mercy and grace. That's where, I mean, law and grace, that's where mercy abides. The law which requires death as payment for sin is not broken by grace. It transfers the punishment. The payment is always required, and the Father's mercy places it on Jesus 
for all who will receive that. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine, says the Lord, I will repay. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. And if he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Romans 12, 19 through 21. That's mercy. You return good for evil. You return love for hate. Our being merciful in the face of offense does not mean that evil is not dealt with. Our act of mercy demonstrates the love, the mercy, and the grace of God available to whoever will receive it. But God will repay. To the one who rejects the grace of God, the vengeance of the Lord will come upon him. To the one who accepts the grace of God, the vengeance of the Lord will fall, or has fallen, on Jesus. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening of our well-being fell upon him. And by his scourging, by his stripes, we are healed. Isaiah 53, 5. I'm going to tell you something. Sin doesn't go unpunished. And when we accept the forgiveness of God, it's because Jesus has taken the punishment upon himself. Righteousness. We studied that in depth in, in uh, last sessions. I mean, so many times, right? It's still all about trusting completely in the mercy of God. You know, two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and was praying, praying to himself. He said, God, I thank you that I'm not like the other people, swindlers, unjust adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all I get. But the tax collector, standing some distance away, was even unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven, but was beating his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, Jesus went on, this man went to the house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Luke 18, 10 to 14. Mercy is where the humble and the king meet. You go to church? Where do you go to meet God? You can only meet him at Jesus Christ. You can only meet him at the place where the humble come together with the king. You know, we have dear friends. They live in North Wales, uh, Bob and Beulah Radcliffe. And we were over in uh, North Wales, and I heard her. She writes these little songs that are just, I mean, off the cuff and just beautiful. She wrote one. I may insert it here, but otherwise I'm going <laughs> to... Uh, Mercy walked in, he drove my ways, I've been redeemed by amazing grace, the blood of Jesus in my case, it happened when mercy walked in. Mercy walked in. Jesus is his name. He is the mercy of God. I all from, We have a hospital here in the United States called Bethesda Hospital, and I think it's where all the politicians and military can go. Right? It's a very important hospital. You know what Bethesda means? Well, let me read you something from John chapter 5, verses 2 to 9. Now there is in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porticos. In these lay a multitude of those who were sick, blind, lame, and withered, waiting for the moving of the waters. For an angel of the Lord went down at certain seasons into the pool and stirred up the water. Whoever then first, and after the stirring up of the water stepped in, was made well from whatever disease with which he was afflicted. 
A man was there who had been for there. He'd been ill for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been a long time in that condition, he said to him, do you wish to get well? The sick man answered him, sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I am coming, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your pallet and walk. Immediately the man became well and picked up his pallet and began to walk. The Hebrew word Beth is the word for house, right? It's most frequently translated that way. And it's generally used in combination with another word like, like Bethesda, right? For example, Bethlehem. Bethlehem means house of bread, which was the city of David. You know, churches that I founded years ago, decades ago, in New York and in Florida, one was called Beth the Bar, which means house of the word, and the other one was Beth Hallel, which means house of praise. Beth doesn't just mean a house as we understand the term today, though. Aberrant Publications says that the fundamental meaning of the word appears to be a kind of enclosure. A Beth is a kind of enclosure specifically for keeping, safekeeping, or containing, and it's contrasted by a wide array of special words, meaning any kind of special habitat, ranging from a tent to a place. The Lord is the place. The Lord is the enclosure. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock, and whom I take refuge, my shield, and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. That's what David said in Psalm 18, verse 2. That's that place. The Lord is the place. The Lord is the house. The Lord is the enclosure that we are to be in. We have to be in Christ Jesus. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. That's Psalms 91, 2. We are called by Jesus to give, or better yet, we're called by Jesus to extend his mercy. And that's what we're going to pick up when we come back next week. What it means, because from whom as much has been given, much isn't required. We have been given mercy, boundless mercy. We need to extend that mercy, that mercy of God. And that's what I'm talking because these are the perilous last days. And these are the things that we will be held accountable for when we come face to face with Jesus Christ. So, Father, help us to be faithful to the end. Help us, Lord God, to walk in your spirit and your word. Help us, Lord God, to be led as you did with an attitude of surrender to the Father, an attitude of humility. If you, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the King of glory, would humble yourself, Lord, how could we not humble ourselves before you and before the Father? Lord, let us be a people of mercy who bring that love, that compassion out into this dark, lawless world that others might be touched while there is yet still time. So I praise you and thank you, Lord, that you can use us, that you can use us who are filled with your spirit because it doesn't depend on us, but you in us, in Jesus' name. Well, until next time, may the Lord our God bless you and use you for his glory. Amen and goodbye. Thank Jesus, my Savior. Love